Thanks to Curiosity or to optimize the design of automotive components, like the lower control arm of this car's suspension system. Finite element analysis software can be used to analyze a wide range of solid mechanics problems, including static, dynamic, buckling, and modal analyses, but it can also be used for fluid flow, heat transfer, and electromagnetic problems. For this introduction to the finite element method, We'll focus on how it applies to static linear elastic stress analysis. Imagine we want to analyze the brackets supporting this air conditioning unit. The goal of a static stress analysis would typically be to calculate the stresses, strains, and displacements within the bracket. These unknowns are called field variables. Internal stresses develop within a body in such a way as to maintain equilibrium over any volume of the body, so we can apply the concept of equilibrium to calculate the field variables. This is easy to do for a simple beam. We can use equilibrium to calculate the bending moment and shear force along it, and from there we calculate the normal and shear stresses in the beam. But enforcing equilibrium over a two-dimensional shape like this bracket is difficult and it becomes even more complicated for a three-dimensional body. The finite element method approaches this problem by splitting the body into a number of small elements that are connected together at nodes. This process is called discretization, and the collection of nodes and elements is called the mesh. Discretization is useful because the equilibrium requirement now only needs to be satisfied over a finite number of discrete elements instead of continuously over the entire body. Several different element shapes can be used. We've used triangular surface elements to model this bracket. Surface elements are two-dimensional elements that are typically used to model thin surfaces. They can be triangular or quadrilateral. Triangular elements are good for modeling awkward shapes, although quadrilateral elements tend to perform better. Solid elements are used for three-dimensional bodies. And then we have line elements. Choosing the right element for your model will depend on the specific scenario being analyzed and requires some expertise. In the case of our bracket, we could have used solid elements or even line elements, depending on how much we wanted to simplify the problem. Even for elements of the same shape, there are hundreds of different types to choose from that each have different formulations and introduce different levels of approximation. A line element can be a bar, for example, that only carries axial loads, or a beam that can carry axial, bending, shear, and torsional loads. We can model the bracket using plane stress surface elements, because the bracket is thin and the loading is all in the same plane, but that's only one of many surface element types. These are all first order elements, but we can also use second order elements which have additional mid-side nodes and are more accurate. For stress analysis problems, the fundamental variable we want to calculate is the displacement at each node. If we know how a body displaces when loads are applied, we'll easily be able to calculate secondary outputs like stress and strain. For each element we can define a vector u that contains all of the possible displacements for the nodes of the element, including rotations. If we're analyzing a two-dimensional case with beam elements, each node can translate along the x and y axes, and it can rotate about the z-axis, so the vector u will look like this. Each of these displacements is called a degree of freedom. For the beam element, we have three degrees of freedom per node, or six in total for a 3D case that increases to 6 degrees of freedom per node. A shell element node also has 3 degrees of freedom in two dimensions, but since the element has four nodes, it has 12 degrees of freedom in total. The nodes of a solid element only have three translational degrees of freedom. The nodes aren't allowed to rotate, and instead, rotation of the element is captured by translation of the nodes. So how can we calculate all of the displacements at every node in our mesh? For a spring, the relationship between force and displacement is defined by Hooke's law. The spring stiffness, K, determines how far the spring will displace for a given force. In the same way, 
we can think of the elements of our mesh as having a certain amount of stiffness that resists deformation. In this equation, F is a vector of the nodal forces and moments, U is the vector of the nodal displacements, and K is the stiffness matrix of the element. A 2D beam element has 6 degrees of freedom, so the displacement vector looks like this, and the force vector and the stiffness matrix will look like this. The element stiffness matrix defines how much each node in the element will displace for a set of forces and moments applied to the nodes, and so is the key to solving the displacements at every node of our mesh. It's a square matrix. The number of rows and the number of columns are equal to the number of degrees of freedom of the element. We can figure out what the terms of the stiffness matrix are by enforcing equilibrium. We'll come back to this later on in the video. But for a 2D beam, the matrix looks like this. We can think of this equation as a system of linear equations that we can solve to obtain the displacements at the nodes of our mesh. If we apply a lateral displacement to node 2, for example, and all of the other degrees of freedom are fixed, and so are equal to zero, we can use the stiffness matrix to calculate the forces and moments at both of the nodes. To make the next steps easier to visualize, let's represent the stiffness matrix in a more abstract form. This is just one element, but our overall mesh will be made up of many more elements. Let's look at a simple example where we have a mesh made up of three 2D beam elements that we're using to model a cantilever beam. We can assemble the individual stiffness matrices for all the elements in our mesh into a huge global stiffness matrix that defines how the entire structure will displace when loads are applied to it. Like the element stiffness matrix, the global stiffness matrix is a square matrix and the number of rows and columns is equal to the total number of degrees of freedom in the model. The element stiffness matrices are assembled together to form the global stiffness matrix based on how the elements are connected together. Elements 1 and 2 are connected at node 2, for example. Continuity tells us that since these two elements are connected at the same node, the displacements for both elements must be the same at the common node. So when we assemble the global stiffness matrix, the terms in the element stiffness matrices corresponding to node 2 should be summed for each degree of freedom. Element 3 is not connected to node 2. So this element's stiffness matrix should have no effect on the displacements at node 2. This is what the actual global